Hello to chapter 81 of Moby Dick by Herman Melville and this chapter is titled The Peacock Meets the Virgin. The predestinated day arrived and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek de Deer, master of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans, are now among the least. But here and there, at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude, you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respect. While yet some distance from the peacock, she rounded to and, dropping a boat, her captain was impelled towards us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. What has he in his hand there? cried Starbuck, pointing to something wavingly held by the German. Impossible! A lamp feeder! Not that, said Stubb. No, no, it's a coffee pot, Mr. Starbuck. He's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Jarman. Don't you see that big tin can there alongside of him? That's his boiling water. Oh, he's all right, is the Jarman. Go along with you, cried Flask. It's a lamp feeder and an oil can. He's out of oil and has come a-begging. However curious it may seem for an oil ship to be borrowing oil on the whaling ground, and however much it may invertedly contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens. And in the present case, Captain Derek de Deer did indubitably conduct a lamp feeder, as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him without at all heeding what he had in his hand. But in his broken lingo the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp feeder and oil can, with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed. But he had not gained his ship's side when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels and so eager for the chase was Derek that without pausing to put his oil can and lamp feeder aboard he slewed round his boat and made after the leviathan lamp feeders. Now, the game having risen to leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him had considerably the start of the Peacock's keels. There were eight whales, an average part. Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks so closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great white wake, as though continually unrolling a great white parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake and many fathoms in the rear swam a huge humped old bull, which by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the port in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless, he stuck to their wake, 
though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muscle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. "'Who's got some paragoric?' said Stubb. "'He has the stomach ache, I'm afraid.' Lord, think of having half an acre of stomachache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I've ever knew to blow from astern. But look, did ever whale yaw so before? It must be. He's lost his tiller. As an overladen Indiaman bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deckload of frightened horses, careens, buries, rolls and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then partly turning over on his cumbrous ribbons, exposing the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle or had been born without it, it were hard to say. Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give you a sling for that wounded arm, cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale line near him. Mind he don't sling thee with it, cried Starbuck. Give way or the German will have him. With one intent, all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish, because not only was he the largest and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture, the Peacod's keels had shot, by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had, Derrick's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared was that from being already so nigh to his mark, he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him. As for Derrick, he seemed quite confident that his, that this would be the case and occasionally, with a deriding gesture, shook his lamp feeder at the other boats. The ungracious and ungrateful dog, cried Starbuck. He mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago. Then in his old intense whisper, Give way, grow, greyhounds, dog to it. I tell you what it's men, cried Stubb to his crew. It's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous yarman. <laughs> Pull, won't ye? And you're going to let that rascal beat you? Do you love brandy? A hawk's head of brandy? Then to the best man. Come, why don't some of ye burst the blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard? We don't budge an inch, we'll be calmed. Hello, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom, and by the Lord, the mast there's budding. This won't do, boys. Look at the yarman! The short and long of it is, men, will ye spit fire or not? Oh, see the sods he makes! cried Flask, dancing up and down. What a hump! Oh, do pile on the beef! Lay like a dog! Oh, my lads, do spring slapjacks and quahogs for supper! You know, my lads, baked clams and muffins! Oh, do do spring! He's a hundred barreler! Don't lose him now! Don't, oh, don't see that jam! And oh, won't you pull for your duff, my lads? Such a sock, such a sucker! Don't you love sperm? 
There goes three thousand dollars, man. A bank, a whole bank, the Bank of England. Oh, do, do, do. What's that jarman about now? At this moment, Derek was in the act of pitching his lamp feeder at the advancing boats and also his oil can, perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backboard toss. The unmannerly Dutch dogger, cried Stop. Pull now, man, like 50,000 line of battleship loads of red-haired devils. What you say, Tashtigo, are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honor of old gay hat? What you say? I say pull like goddamn, cried the Indian. Fiercely, but Evenly incited by the taunts of the German, the Peacock's three boats now began ranging almost abreast and, so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman, when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after oarsman with an exhilarating cry of there she slides now, hurrah for the white ash breeze, down with the jarman, sail over him. But so decided an original start had Derek had that, spite of all their gallantry, he would have proved the victor in this race had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman while his clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash and while, in consequence, Derek's boat was nigh to capsizing and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb and Flask. With a shout they took a mortal start forward and slanting ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diag diagonically in the whale's imminent wake, while stretching from them on both sides was the foaming swell, foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now, to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke, he spasmodically sank in the sea or sideways rolled towards the sky, his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast, dumb brute of the sea was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable, while still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw and omnipotent tail, there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitied. Seeing now that but a very few moments more would have the Peacock's boats the advantage and rather than be thus foiled of this game, Derek chose to hazard what to him must have seemed the most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did this harponeer stand up for the stroke than all three tigers, Queekak, Tashtigo, Dagoo, instinctively sprang to their feet and standing in a diagonal row simultaneously pointed their bobs and darted over the head of the German harponeer. Their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire. The three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force that both Derek 
and his baffled harponier were spilled out and sailed over by the three flying keels. So I'm going to stop for today. Bye-bye. Till next time with the next part of this chapter. Tomorrow, by the way, Halloween, October 31st, nothing of that sort, not Moby Dick, not Sherlock Holmes. There will be a, a very special reading, a Halloween reading. Stay tuned. Bye-bye. Till next time.